multidisciplinary research is something that is, is critical to advancing the field. And, and she's been very engaged in that throughout uh, her time here at the university, as well as before that, too. So, um, again, on behalf of the University of Louisville and the President's Office, uh, we want to thank you for, for coming out here. I hope that you guys have a great time. Thank you very much. Uh, I will not introduce the keynote. I will introduce Dr. Ayman el and Dr. Nuru, who helped organize the bioengineering track and helped uh, bring our uh, keynote speaker for today. Thank you, Dr. Adil Madrabi, uh, and also a special thanks to the ISSPAP committee that uh, uh, that helped us organize this and uh, enable us to organize this event. And thanks to all of you. We were initially planning on a one-day session, and we, due to the overwhelming response that we got, the bioengineering session has been extended to two days. So thank you so much for uh, your response to this solicitation for papers. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Berkima. Um, she's the Owsley B. Fraser Rehab Rehabilitation Chair uh, in Neurological Surgery, and she's the Associate Director of the Kentucky Spinal Cord Research Center, and she's doing some really amazing work uh, for patients with spinal cord injury, and uh, we are indeed uh, grateful to have her here uh, to give us a talk on all the amazing work that she's doing. What's going to move forward and, and into the clinic is, is really the advancement of the technology. And we've been really fortunate here at the University of Louisville to work with the Speed School. And in fact, Rob and I'm in our own many uh, of our papers and patents that we have together. And we really wouldn't be able to do uh, the work that we're doing uh, without that collaboration. So we're really, uh, really grateful uh, for your um, work uh, with us. So, um, you know, I, I like to start out with just introducing the epidural stimulation program because it really does take a village. Um, we have um, so many individuals that uh, are part of the program and from so many different backgrounds. In engineering, I've already mentioned, but we have physicians, neurosurgeons, physiatrists, cardiologists. We have neuroscientists, which are the core scientific um, discipline uh, that really is behind uh, the scientific, initial scientific discovery. We have exercise science, exercise, uh, science. we have um, uh, uh, computer science, we have um, just a whole array uh, of individuals who, who work together. Uh, and we also have a very uh, unique uh, program in the center where our faculty actually work very integratively and collaboratively. So we have different scientific cores, um, scientific faculty head up those cores, and, uh, and we um, all work uh, really closely together. Uh, so uh, Dr. Chen heads up the engineering core and is the one who uh, direct, collaborates more with the engineering school. Dr. Ovechkin is cardiovascular and respiratory. Dr. Harity and Hupshire uh, head up our gallbladder and sexual function core. And Dr. Reich um, is the motor control. Dr. Angeli uh, really runs the entire program, day-to-day -day operations, and, and, and leads up the uh, motor control of walking and voluntary. Um, our clinicians, uh, Dr. Boyachi is the neurosurgeon and Dr. the clinical director of Kesher. He puts in all the implants. Um, Dr. Hirsch, who we sadly lost recently um, to another program but is still collaborating with us. Um, Dr. Wagers is uh, our physical medicine and rehabilitation physician who supports the team. And then um, uh, Beatrice uh, is our statistician and then uh, Dr. Haslin is our our um, intense uh, data 
numbers, programming, um, faculty person. And so we have this diverse group who has their specialty. And, um, and so I'm going to kind of take you through how is it and why is it and how did we get here uh, and why do we need so many faculty um, to really look at this problem. So this is how we work. Um, we have three programs, an adult neuro recovery program, epidural stimulation program, and a pediatric neuro recovery program that Andrea Behrman heads up. I'm really going to talk today about our epidural stimulation program. But spinal cord injury um, is very devastating. And it's devastating because not only do you lose motor function, which is what's, I think, at the top of everyone's mind, but you also lose bowel, uh, bladder, and sexual function, cardiovascular, pulmonary function. You end up with metabolic disease. Um, you, I already talked about met, uh, uh, motor. Um, and then you end up with having higher rates of cancer, higher rates of uh, cardiac death, higher rates of every disease you have, a person with spinal cord injury gets it more often, sooner. And uh, so as we um, started focusing, as I'll tell you the story, of one part of um, the scientific mechanisms of motor control, we started learning more about these, all these other areas and then built our program really about all of the um, Motor, the motor functions and physiological systems as well. So I'm going to just start out giving you a snapshot of time of where we are with epidural stimulation. And so this, we are now implanting one a month. So this slide is not old. So we have 19 actually implanted uh, to date. I didn't have time to uh, update this, but. Um, so that's over a nine year period. We're actually one per month. We have had two significant adverse events, and I'm glad to say that there haven't been more in the last five, but we've had one hip fracture and one infection uh, resulting in an explant. So epidural stimulators, we use off the shelf pain stimulators, and as I mentioned in the beginning, um, that's not sufficient for this to be able to translate to clinic. These are, devices are going to have to be designed for people with spinal cord injury, and that's going to be a technology advance. We need control algorithms, we need big data to be uh, reduced, analyzed, and control algorithms, we need interfaces that people who have limited hand function uh, to be designed for them, and uh, so, uh, but now we're using off the shelf, and even the off the shelf infection rate is somewhere between 5 to 13 percent. People with spinal cord injury are immunosuppressed. So we're even at a higher risk of infection. So we have very strict infection protocols now that we follow. And um, so we've uh, been so far since that first infection, we've not had one since. And so uh, we're, we're very grateful for that and keep a very close eye on that. So um, at this time, we have 10 males and three uh, females. We've had four males and one female. It's difficult for us to try really hard to recruit. First of all, 25% of females in the SCI population. And interestingly, this could be a paper on its own, I think. Women say no four to five times more often than males to participate in the research. So it's kind of interesting, and we're, we're pretty intrigued by that. Um, so uh, uh, we try to, um, uh, we are committed to keeping the same representation of women in our studies as are in the population. And um, so uh, we will be keeping up that 20, at least 25%. Um, the range is C5 cervical uh, to thoracic, um, two to eight years post-injury. We've now increased that out. We just implanted someone nine years post-injury. And um, Asia A, uh, B, and C. And so for you, I'll just let you know, we don't really Asia, I put that up there because it's sort of universal for clinicians. But what Asia A and B mean is motor complete. It means by all clinical and neurophysiological measures, you can't detect any crossing of the lesion from a functional standpoint of motor um, or sensory for A, and for B, it's motor. So from a scientific perspective, that was important for us that that was the model that we were. 
So the way that um, our program is set up, we started out with motor control, and then I'll tell you about that when I tell you the story. Um, but then we started branching out because we started observing things in other systems. But the way that the program works is people come in and what we call either proof of principle study, which is a small cohort, usually four. That's a historical number for us. We'll take four individuals. We'll divide, decide to find a very rigid protocol, and we'll have very specific basic science hypothesis-driven questions that we're asking about mechanism. And then it'll be in motor control, cardiovascular, respiratory, all lateral or sexual function. And then we just started a large prospective randomized efficacy study. Okay, so what's the difference between the proof of principle and the efficacy? Well, an efficacy is exactly what we're saying. We are now looking for clinical efficacy. So we take from these types of studies and this inner system participation, this proof of principle, and we design an efficacy study. So in this study right here, this is a cardiovascular study, and we're really looking at whether we can use the epidural stimulation stimulator to normalize blood pressure in people with spinal cord injury. It's a 36 uh, cohort study. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about all these principal studies. Um, but this is our first efficacy study um, that we're doing. Now these, uh, so once people go get implanted, because they have so many issues from their spinal cord injury, they're already implanted. So they passed actually the, the most significant risk, which is the infection. We can re-enter them into um, one of these inner systems. So they can come in and they can participate in another motor control study or a cardiovascular and respiratory study or a bowel bladder and sexual function study. They can participate then in parallel. We don't have to, they could they have a choice of explanting the stimulator, keeping the stimulator in and using it, safe if they can show us they can use it safely in their daily life, as much or as little as they want, but they can come in and participate in other studies. Okay, so how, what's our current working theory? Our current working theory, this is the new, what I say is the new knowledge. Now, some of it hasn't been new knowledge in other species. In fact, people have known this for about 70 years, that, the human, that not the human spinal circuitry, but the spinal circuitry of all other species has been known to control whatever type of locomotion that they had at the level of the spinal cord, that the brain's not needed chicken with their head cut off. Everyone knows about that. But every other species has been known that the human spinal circuitry controls locomotion. However, controversy in the human. Many people believe it's got to be our brains. It's magnificent brain, brains of ours that control locomotion. But why would evolution create or duplicate an entire part of the nervous system that could all, already control locomotion when it already existed in the spinal cord. So thus the circuit, the, the controversy. So that's what our, my research focused on. And for the first 15 years, we did studies that were like those of the animals to see if the human circuitry was sophisticated like that in other species. And so we gathered a lot of evidence and, and that led us to go into the epidural stimulation studies. And, oops, sorry about that. Um, and that led us to what we now have, I think, is significant evidence that is now starting to become well accepted, is that the human spinal circuitry is the final pump of pathway for all neural control of motor behavior. And not just walking, not just locomotion, but even voluntary movement. And I think I'm going to show you some evidence for that today. Now, the surprising and second working theory is that the spinal circuitry is actually an integrated system of all physiological systems and it's actually a secondary or tertiary controller of other systems like our heart and our respiratory system our bladder and that's why all these systems go so awry after spinal cord injury when we not just from the dis the injury itself but from us making these individuals immobile not going to the circuitry and having it, helping it to learn again and function again, that all these systems go around. Okay, so now 
I'm going to take you back in time and tell you the story of how we got to these two working theories. So, we started out back, I told you that in other mammals it was well accepted that locomotion was controlled by the human spinal circuitry. We had done similar experiments that had been done in mammals and showed that there was some evidence, and that evidence was based on retraining the nervous system, showing that sensory information from retraining could drive motor patterns in those Asia apes, motor complete, or Asia bees, motor complete, but had some sensation. So, but we still didn't have really direct evidence. Now, in those animal experiments, epidural stimulation had been used to activate that intrinsic circuitry, and that circuitry is called central pattern generation. So in your spinal cord is this intrinsic circuitry that without the brain, and even without sensory information that helps drive it, if you put a stimulator on there or throw drugs on, which was later done in animal experiments and recorded, you could get a locomotor pattern that looks like walking, or looks like swimming, or flying, or jumping. <coughs> and so we went to do a proof of principle experiment in one individual. And we picked an Asian B for safety because we thought we don't know what the stimulator is going to do, so we wanted to be able to feel its impaired sensation. We wanted to be able to feel. But something surprising happened. When we put him up on the treadmill to get him to step, and we didn't expect any behavioral changes, he did something very surprising. And this is, I'm going to skip over this, this is just the medical data showing, uh, showing his injury level. But here, one thing I do want to point out is this, where the stimulator is. It's in the lumbosacral spinal cord, so the lower spinal cord, where the circuitry is, that central pattern generation, it's not related to where the injury is. Your injury could be thoracic, it could be cervical, it's not related to where the injury is. And we place it really carefully by doing neurophysiological recordings in the spinal cord so we can line it up exactly where we want it in the spinal cord. Lumbosacral spinal cord here is where we want to line it up. Okay, so <coughs> something very surprising happened. Now we trained this individual with something called locomotor training. So what we knew from the animals is you could completely transect the animals and if you train them right by providing sensory information related to walking, so move their hind limbs or their paws or whatever it was or um, over and over again without the brain, the spinal circuitry of any species could relearn for a cat to walk again by interpreting that sensory information. So we had trained this individual, tried to train him by putting him in a harness and moving his legs and stuff like that, 170 sessions to stay in staff, nothing changed. 170 sessions, these individuals tried to train him. We put the epidural stimulator in, found a configuration that supported this circuitry. We did not, he did not expect to walk. He was helping us with science. We didn't expect to. We just wanted to look and try to find the circuitry. And the first, and the first time we put him up on the treadmill, this happened.
Maybe we can help him. Maybe he can learn to sing. So we didn't train him to step. We tried to train him to stand. And so we took him over ground. And what you can see here is he said three, two, one, let go. And he relearned to stand over ground independently. And what you see here, two important things from the stand. First of all, the stimulator's on. Okay? But he does not start standing or generating electromyographic activity or neuromuscular activity until he wants to stand and he loads activity on his legs. So it's the, the spinal circuitry integrates, it gets ready, the circuitry, the, 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 the uh, spot, the, sorry, the stimulator gets that circuitry back and ready to do what it used to do before injury. And then it interprets that loading information, and we didn't know this at the time, but that intent for him to, to stand. And what you see here is the same stimulation, but he, you know, you're, I'm standing here, but what am I doing? I'm shifting, right? I'm shifting around, but I'm not falling over, right? Why not? Because as I shift forward, my, my, the ankle, my ankle muscles in the front are keeping me from going forward, and I shift back. Well, his spinal cord is able to do that too, but he has no detectable input from the brain. So we were able to train him to stand. Now, remember the stepping. This is a stepping pattern. So this is a standing. This is no stimulator, nothing. Nothing happens. Turn the stimulator on. Here, standing, he can stand. Same stimulation. Now we give him information about stepping, and we get a stepping pattern. But he can't step independently. Okay? So he can't step independently. But we get him to stand independently. All right, but then he turns from research participant into scientist, okay? Because even though we're like, okay, can stand independently, the circuitry's there, we know, we know voluntary movement has to be in the brain. When we wiggle our toes or our fingers, that has to be controlled by the brain. We're humans. Animals don't think about, well, maybe monkeys, but that's in their brain too. But he, when we were doing a boring mapping experiment, he tried to move his toe. On his own, he tried to move his toe. We didn't ask him to. We never thought he could. And if he hadn't tried to do it, we would have never discovered this. So this, I'm not going to show you for long, but this is without the stimulator. This goes on and on. I'm asking him to move his toe, let him down, nothing. But you turn the stimulator on. Look here. And he's able to voluntarily move. Okay? And what's important about this is if you look, these are the extensors. They're off. These are the flexors. They're on. This is a very discreet, controlled movement. So he said, Susie, how am I doing this? And I brilliantly said, I have no idea how you're doing this. Absolutely no idea how you're doing this. Okay. So I said, okay, I think I can figure this out. You're an Asian bee. You have sensory fibers that cross the lesion. Those sensory fibers must be plastic. They connected with the brain. They turned into motor fibers because we trained you for seven months to stand. In the brain, it turned into motor fibers. So now we have sensory fibers that are really motor fibers. The brain, that's a brilliant hypothesis. I'm going to get a science paper out of this. Brilliant. Okay. So we recruited Kent. He's an Asia A. He has no sensory fibers. It's a good hypothesis, don't you think? Come on, get on my side. If, come on, it is a good hypothesis. If, if you bought in to the current paradigm, which I completely bought in. Oops, I did. Ah, where'd I go? What happened? Someone help me. <laughs> the PowerPoint on the 
No, it's here. Oh, oh, over here. We don't know if he could have done it on the first time. 
but 19 out of 19 now have been able to move voluntarily. Who by every other standard, clinical or neurophysiological um, recording are considered complete. So what that does tell us is that there are still some viable cells across that injury level and that I think also you have to make the interpretation that complex control signals can't be responsible for our movements from the brain. That maybe these intense signals are probably, hey, I'd like to move my toe, please do it, spinal cord. And that the spinal cord takes care of those intricate details. The spinal cord is that final decision maker. So that's how we get to that working theory about the movement. Now, again, we go back to stepping. Now we tried to train, so we, we trained four people, our first four people, the one you saw on the first slide, to stand and then to step. And I'm going to tell you about that. What we started observing, so back then, you know, we tried all four, the next three could move voluntarily. We were, a little, we were still a little slow on the uptake of this <laughs> But here they're stepping, but if they thought about stepping, their, their EMG got bigger. But when we were stepping them, and even when we were standing them, we weren't, we were just using that sensory information because that's what all the animals were trained with. They weren't trained to think about stepping. It was just the sensory cues that retrained the circuitry to uh, learn again. So here's the results of them standing. And I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly. I'm not gonna go too deep into the mechanisms here. But, um, well, here's the standing. Did overground in the standing frame, provided the sensory cues. Here's the four people. So we, we did the A and the B, and then we did another A and B. Okay, so and this is where we started with our four cohorts. So can we can we repeat it again? And we did repeat it again. And what we found was so these are key points that the activity turns to me later on. Down, they're sitting down, there's no EMG activity, it's not activated until the sensory cue is there. So this is the mechanistic, the scientific part of it. The spinal cord integrates, and this, this is how we move too. Your spinal cord is constantly paying attention to all the sensory cues that are going in from the environment and what's coming from your brain, what's coming from your eyes, we showed that in the brain paper, what's coming from your ears, what's coming from your intent, your brain stem, your emotions. And it's taking all that information in, integrating it, and then making a decision about your motor movement. Okay. <coughs> and then all four were able to learn how to stand independently. And to different degrees. Now, balance was still a challenge. But as we got, and we still don't know this, we Everybody seems to do a little better. So are we getting better, or is that a coincidence? Are we getting better at retraining them and teaching them how to, how to train? But they all learned how to stick it. Here's another example here. Now, after we trained them to stand, we went back to what I had really started trying to understand 25 years ago is, can the human spinal cord circuitry relearn how to step? So we went and we trained them to step. And they didn't really learn how to step. No independent step. But three out of three of them lost the ability to stand. Now don't worry, we were able to retrain train them to stand. So they relearned how to stand, but they lost the ability to step. So what did that tell us? Well, that told us how to train. And we, we were doing another study for cardiovascular function, and as I told you, I told you ahead of the story, 19 out of 19 now can voluntarily move. So we took a step back and we said, okay, we know how we train matters, and we know that everybody has some viable cells, and they can intentionally control voluntary movement. We need to, we need to do this differently. So we recruited four more people, and we changed how we train. Now before I tell you that though, I want to divert and tell you a little bit about the cardiovascular system. So again, research participant becomes scientist. So this young man, Drew, had very uh, severe 
your cardiovascular dysfunction. So when we were doing the motor studies, every time he'd stand up, he'd pass out. Every time he'd stand up, he'd pass out. And so it took him three days to do an experiment. It would normally take one, because once they would go to, and he didn't actually pass out, but he'd almost pass out. Three times down, and we'd call it for the day. So I noticed during the mapping that I could find configurations that would raise his blood pressure, but not activate his muscles. So scientifically, that would still be a good experiment. So we, I said, how about if we tried this? And then he said to me, hey, if I could do this at home, it would change my life. I could get dressed faster, I could go out to eat with my wife, and I wouldn't have to tilt my chair back and look really ridiculous. Could I do this at home? So I said, well, let me check with the FDA. And he said, well, you can show it's safe. So based on that, we did another proof of principle for cohort study. And I'm gonna show you the results of that study. So we took four people, three A's and B, higher injury, because they had more cardiovascular deficits, the higher the injury. Now these <coughs> individuals live, do you guys all know your blood pressures? Okay. Anybody have 100, 120 or below? How many? Oh boy, everybody's over 120? Oh, geez. Okay, these people are 90 and below. They pass out, one woman passes up, would pass out four or five times a day. That's their resting blood pressure. Okay, so you can see 90, 91, 105. This is, this is laying down to 70, 86, 86, 64. Okay, blood pressure. So what we were able to do is we are able to use the stimulator without activating muscles, and we are able to get them with the stimulator on to normal blood pressure during the day. So this was the first study, proof of principle, and so you can see each individual you can keep it at 100, in between 110 and 120. Maybe I could use yours and get it between 110 and 120. Maybe we could try that. It would be back down. No, actually we can. We can bring it back down. But I don't know if it works. You had to pick the right configuration, so that's important. The configurations are different for each one. And then what was really important was, remember I said if they stood up, they would pass out? So here, that shows this. So if you, if this is just a sit-up test, not a full stand-up test. So this is the blood pressure drops down, and then if it gets so low, they're going to pass out and come back up. This is the heart rate, so even the heart rate going up to try to stop it, doesn't stop it, but when we turn the stimulator on, we can alleviate that. But what was even more surprising is when we train them for 80 sessions, even without the stimulator, they were able to sit up and not and, and keep their blood pressure up. So there was some long-term adaptation with this. So not just motor, but cardiovascular adaptation. So this is the evidence that's starting us to support this idea that there is a secondary uh, control systems located in this hospital. So we were able to alleviate chronic, chronic hypertension with the epidural stimulation and the orthostatic hypertension that they suffer with every, every day. Okay. So let's go back to the stepping store. What happened to the stepping store? So, Told you those we trained those four people to step. They didn't learn to step independently. They lost the ability to stand. We did retrain them to stand again. So they took that home with them. They could move their legs voluntarily and stand, but not stand. So we brought in four new people and we did it differently. So what we did <coughs> is so here's our we matched these four as close as we could. So two A's and two B's. Try to get the same levels of injuries, it was hard, about the same time since injury, about the same age. And this is what we did before. We did stand training for 80 sessions, and then step training for 80 sessions, and they practiced voluntary training, essentially when they wanted. It wasn't, it wasn't standardized, because remember, we just sort of discovered that. And we're like, oh, cool, do that at home. See how that goes. So, what we did here is we said, okay, Let's see how sophisticated this model circuitry is. Let's train them both at the same time. Because we, we knew from animal literature that if you 
trained a transected cat to step and then trained it to stand, it would lose the ability to step. So we're like, well, we're not going to do that experiment ever. Let's try it. We're going to train both. So in the morning, we train it to step, and in the afternoon, to stand. In the morning, to stand, in the afternoon, to step. So we also increased the intensity, so they were training more often, same number of sessions. But we also brought in that volunteer. So when we were selecting the configurations, we had them think about it. We had them think about every step they took. Think about flexion. Think about driving your foot into the treadmill. Think about overall walking. Think, think, think. And tend, and tend, and tend. Try to bring those few cells that were still there into this retraining process. And what, so what happened with, oh, sorry. So what happened with this? So what happened was all, eight, all four of them were able to get the four voluntary, and then the four cardiovascular that I showed you, they also could move voluntarily. So we tested them all. So that's where we get that 12 out of 12. Well, let me go. Oh, I'm going backwards. Sorry, guys. Also, they all learned how to stand. And they stood better than the first one. Okay? And then this is what happened with step. So all of them were able to step at least one leg independently for hundreds of steps. Okay? So all four could step independently, hundreds of steps. And then and the other thing we also added was more complex. So we would look at the configuration and we would add things. So we got a little bit better too. So there were a lot of things that we added to this program. Okay, so this is, this shows you here stepping. You can see them stepping here. With all, this is the stepping with the sensory cues. With the first four, this is just what we focus on. We turn the stimulator on. And this is what we would focus on. Okay, but now, watch us bring in the intent. Okay, so now we have to see, can you see that difference there where he's really thinking about that? And over here, you can see the big difference in the image. So we added that component to the stuff. And here's what we found. Turn on the stimulation. Now 
whatever remaining viable cells were there and the sensory information. And I'm going to skip right to here because we're running out of time and show you what we ended up getting in two of those four. So these are completely motor paralyzed people who were ultimately able to walk over ground just with balance assist. Only when the stimulators come. Only after intense stand and step training, integrating that intent combined with the epidural stimulator. So that's Jeff. He was the first human being who was completely paralyzed to be able to walk over ground. there. The technology exists. We know all the technology that needs to be there. We just need all the technology specialists to get at the same table and help us put it together. So that's the, the story of the last 25 years of my life in 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Do you allow any questions? Oh, of course. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Um, um, yeah, so she asked, was EMG the only physiological measure? No, so we, um, so we look at forces, we look at EMG, um, do, uh, so we do force, so we do strength, we do bone density, Metabolic measures, we do um, is it bone density, we do MRI, so we do lots of different physiological measures to see how things are changing. We do independence measures, um, so we do lots of different measures. And also, how do we validate? Yeah, so that's a good question. She asked, how do you validate intent? So, one, you have to believe them, right? So you say, okay, tell us now when you're thinking. It, right? The other ways that you can do it is by having them follow. So when you do voluntary, you can have them follow the movement in a sine wave or change their force by a tone or go faster as the foot tone goes faster. So you can validate that their intent matches some random signal that you're doing. Or you can do something randomly. Like you can say, okay, I want you to move your right leg uh, independently. Now move your left leg. So you can do things that show that you're telling them something independent, randomly, and you're not saying, oh, see, and then it's like, oh, do you write it? So some things you just have to say, you know, don't, don't intend to do it now, intend to do it now. Don't intend to do it now, intend to do it now. And you do that randomly. So those types of maneuvers. Can't do that with animals. Yep. What are the dimensions of the control stimulus? Is this, I guess, maybe the most complex during the walking? Is it uh, multiple stimulus all on and all off, or is it a very complex? Yeah, it's kind of, it's, so we're limited by how the stimulator's set up. So you're allowed to have, we call them cohorts, which is, 
So you have, you have 16 contacts, so you can select any combination of anode cathode. And then you have some options of frequency and pulse width. The old device, the previous device we used, you could only go up to 450 microseconds and then 10 volts, it was voltage control. Now we have a current control device. But you have four, four cohorts, we call them cohorts or programs that you can put, and they're, they're interleaved, but they're kind of set. So if you use one program, you can have 50 hertz, but if you set another program, then the way that's delivered is set. So like you would have 50 hertz and it would be like, you know, boom, boom, and then it waits and boom, boom. So the actual frequency that's delivered to the nervous system starts getting complex. Um, so it is quite complex um, how these are delivered. Um, you know, so one of the things that we really need is the ability to deliver what we call these cohorts more strategically because we know from the animals, like for stepping, that you need a frequency somewhere between 30 and 50 hertz at the rostral part of the circuitry and more lower frequency at the caudal to get to get stance. And we know, and we know from what we're doing in humans that it's really similar. So it is pretty complex. The voluntary isn't that as complex. If you get in the right area, just to support that level of the cord in the beginning, um, then they can they can do it quite well once they figure out how to get that connection. And as they train over time, pretty much those tend to converge into one or two configurations. As the spinal cord, we think you know, is plastic and changes and it learns. So those become less. Complex. The cardiovascular configurations um, start out the same way. They start out pretty complex, but then as the training goes on, they become less complex. But definitely the walking are the most complex, and we think are why everyone is not able to go over ground because we're limited by the constraints of how they've designed the hardware and software of the computer. So we're hoping they're starting to open up the technology for us and we'll be able to get better results. Um, a couple of quick questions. One, why did you focus on the systolic pressure rather than the mean arterial pressure or the diastolic pressure? Because that would be more. Well, to be honest with you, it's like just started there and then it was really lucky they both fell in love. Like the idea was to like, let's start with systolic and then we'll have to adjust if diastolic and heart rate are out of range. And it just, just once we controlled systolic, the system worked pretty well. Now, that's not exclusively true. Like if I found a systolic pressure and that was stable and the heart rate was really high or really low, I would go look for another configuration. So that wasn't exclusively true. But I think also, like physiologically, your systolic pressure is the one that drives the blood flow through the body. So I think physiologically that made a lot of sense. And then your heart rate is the one that tries to modulate so I think it made physiological sense to start. So uh, you're trying to activate, you know, it's almost as if once they have a spinal cord injury, their parasympathetic is more of a vagal nerve stimulation to the predominant one, and then... Well, it's interesting, so I'm glad you asked that question. So first of all, you know, we should all be very humble when we do science, because, you know, I was kind of like, ugh, I was so excited about that whole idea of the complete and the voluntary thing. So then I thought, wow, we discovered something brand new, right? Like with this cardiovascular. Okay, this is like a novel thing that, you know, your dream science paper, right? But I have this habit of every time I write a paper, I go back and read the literature from 1890. Don't ask me why. I don't know. That's just a good number. Sherrington is a big person <coughs> in our field, and he was in the 1890s. So I always go back and I read everything from 1890. And in 1970, this group from Japan did, the, did this CAD experiment called the bionic baroreflex. And they stimulated in the same area. They cut the barrel, they did some transection, whatever, they shut down the barrel, did something, baroreflex, and they stimulated in that area, and they showed if they stimulated there, they could get the baroreflex to work. And then they were doing a heart failure experiment, not in spinal cord injury, and they were putting in, uh, electrodes for heart failure, and they got 
IRB approval, and they pulled them down and they showed proof of principle that you could increase blood pressure and put the electrodes where that was. So there must be some likely sympathetic fibers in the human circuitry that helps maintain blood pressure. So if you think about it, it, it makes sense because, first of all, the primary controller of the heart is the SA node. Then you have parasympathetic sympathetic. But let's think about it. If I'm about to run, do I want my heart to start beating like 10 steps later? Or maybe it's be already beating before I take that first step? So if your spinal cord knows it's going to run, maybe it should get that heart going ahead of time. So it makes perfect sense that there should be some secondary tertiary controller that's in that spinal circuitry. So somebody already found it before, but there was only two papers in 1970 that were not even cited, I think, five times. So now they're cited, cited in our Tammy Neurology paper. Like, I want to find them and call them and say, hey, did you see we cited you? <laughs> you know? So, yeah, so we think that they're likely sympathetic fibers. Like, that would make the most sense, or sympathetic blood fibers. Because they showed in the cat they were sympathetic fibers. Um, and also, when you are not craning, uh, it's almost as if, you know, the fibers, uh, it's, it's almost like twitching when, you know, I go back to the twitching. It's almost as if the training kind of fights them down. So what causes that twitching in the first place, rather than firing all that noise that you see before the training that goes away after? Well, I think that, that what happens is that, you know, so when a person has a spinal cord injury, as devastating as that is, you only lose the neurons where the bone is broken. And that's thousands of neurons. But below the injury, there's a million more neurons that are helping and active and communicating. And so they're fired. They're trying to do something. But not something that's functional because they've lost all that information that comes from the brain. Not to say the brain information is important. And now they're immobile. They don't have loading information. They're in a wheelchair. Their muscles are atrophying. They're not getting signals from the heart. And so they, but they're active. So they contract the muscles, right? So you have activation that's abnormal or maladaptive. So I think what we're really doing is we're supporting the circuitry to start functioning again like it used to. The circuitry to function as it did before. So that's when you, why you see those maladaptive patterns before the training. So we just give back the sensory information it was used to having before the injury. Well, thank you so, so much. <laughs> just announcements because before you run away. For those of you that are first day here, restrooms are in the back to the left, elevator to the right if you want to use an elevator. We have now a coffee break, but just don't run, just a second, okay? Uh, I want to also, we thank Dr. Guru and Ayman for uh, Baz who prepared for the bio track, but I don't want to ignore that we have uh, two technical co-chairs that I want to thank them, Dr. Michael Maguire and uh, Daniel Sierra Sosa. They really work very hard with the bio people to make sure things are coordinated. One more thing, the bio, uh, engineering sessions will be in the right room, the signal processing and the computers and the AI will be in the left room, okay? Uh, there will be lunch here, so hopefully they will get this ready by lunch time when we are in the sessions there. So, uh, enjoy the day. Thank you so much.